Hello everyone and welcome to this virtual lecture course on electromagnetism. My name is Dr Andrew Mitchell and in this lecture I want to talk about the energy that's stored in electromagnetic fields. In the previous lectures we began to look at dynamical effects within the theory of electromagnetism, focusing on what happens when the elect electric field is changing, the magnetic field is changing, due to changing uh, charge distributions or currents. We looked at the concepts of the EMF and of Faraday's induction. We talked about mutual inductance. We talked about self-inductance and so on. So today I want to sort of build upon this framework and revisit the question of uh, energy within electrodynamics. This time thinking more about dynamical systems with, with changing fields and so on. Previously, we looked at the energy uh, stored in an electrostatic system. We saw that we can think about the energy as being stored within the charge distribution itself, or alternatively, we can think about the energy as being contained in the electric fields. So what's the analogue of this for magnetism and magnetic fields? Of course, we know that magnetic fields uh, can do no work, so magnetic forces can do no work. So does that mean that there's no energy that's stored in the magnetic fields themselves? Well, actually, we'll see that that's not the case, and there is energy contained in magnetic fields. I also want to look at the, the full question of what happens uh, in a dynamical system beyond the static limit when we have uh, varying electric and magnetic fields. We'll see, for example, um, that there's a concept of uh, energy conservation of course, we know that the total energy is conserved, just like the way the total charge is conserved. But in the previous lectures, we saw how a much more powerful statement of charge conservation exists, the so-called continuity equation. We don't just think of the global conservation of charge, we think about the local conservation of charge. An amount of charge in a given bounded region can increase or decrease, provided that an equivalent amount of charge is passing through the walls of the container. Likewise, with energy, we have the so-called work energy theorem, which tells us that the amount of energy in a bounded region can, of course, change, provided there's an energy flux through the walls of that container. This is described by the so-called pointing vector, the direction of which tells you about the direction energy flow, and the magnitude of which tells you about the amount of energy that's lost through the walls of the container. And this will have relevance for, for example, dipole radiation. OK, so that's what I want to talk about today. Let's get down to work. So this lecture is going to be about the energy that's stored in electromagnetic fields. Before we begin talking about the dynamical case, let's remind ourselves of the situation in electrostatics. This will set the scene for what is to come. So in the static case, and on the electric side of the theory, we know that the work done to assemble a given ch charge distribution is given by one half of the sum over all of the particles, the charged particles that make up the charge distribution, times their charge multiplied by the potential at the position of that charge. So this is the work done to assemble a given charge distribution, which comprises n point charges, qi, located at positions ri. And there's a few things to note about this formula. The first is that this is the electric potential evaluated at the point Ri, but it's the electric potential excluding the point charge I. So it's the potential due to all the other charges, not the one, not the QI in question, but all the other ones. And that's why we put this primed on the V there. And the second thing to note is that we have a factor of one half in here to avoid the double counting. So what do I mean by that? 
Well, um, if we imagine uh, the energy that's required to bring a pair of charges together, we imagine fixing one of the charges in space and bringing the other charge out from infinity and putting it in position Ri. And that means that the energy contribution is Qi times the potential um, due to the first charge at position Ri. However, because there are two particles, we don't want to count that interaction twice by summing um, over first the, inter the interaction energy of the first particle to the second, and then to the, from the second to the first, because that's the same thing. So in this sum, we have a sum over particles i equals 1, i equals 2, and so on, all the way up to n particles. But the interaction is only pairwise. And so we have a factor of a half out of the front to avoid any double counting. So that's the uh, formula in electrostatics. And we can manipulate this a little bit um, into a different form that involves uh, first a continuum charge density, rho, rather than uh, a discrete charge distribution of point charges, qi. And then we can actually cast the whole thing purely in terms of the electric field. So let's see how that works again. So first of all, let's suppose that our charges qi are actually a charge density rho multiplied by a volume element d tau. So the charge density rho is a charge per unit volume. So a small amount of charge qi is then replaced by a charge density multiplied by a volume. And now we have a volume element, so we also replace the sums by integrals. So the formula that we had previously, uh, that the work done is a half the sum of q times v, this now becomes a half of the integral of rho v d tau. And we're integrating over volume of some particular charge density that we're interested in. Now here you'll notice that I've actually dropped the prime on the V. Previously I mentioned that we had this caveat that the potential should be evaluated due to all charges except the one in question, and now I'm dropping that requirement, and that's because we're imagining that we have uh, infinitely many uh, particles all smeared out into a continuum charge distribution, and so the difference between an infinitesimal amount of charge being there or not there makes no difference. Okay, so we have this um, formula for the work done to now assemble a continuum charge distribution described by rho, <coughs> and we know that this can actually be written in a slightly different form using Gauss's law. And that's because, to go from this step to this step, I'm using that the divergence of the electric field is rho over epsilon naught. Uh, just a reminder in here, this V is the potential, the electrostatic potential. When we're talking about dynamics, it won't be so easy because we will have a scalar potential, but it won't be directly related to the energy. Okay, so the next step is to actually do integration by parts on this integral that we have here. Why would I want to do such a thing? Well, what we have is the integral of the product of two things, one of which contains a derivative. Now, integration by parts can be used to transfer the derivative under the integral sign from one of the factors to the other. And you can do that, it just introduces a minus sign and you get a boundary term in addition. So we get minus epsilon naught over two, the integral of, and then instead of it being the divergence of the electric field, it's going to be the electric field dotted into the gradient of the potential, still integrated over d tau.
and this is over some particular volume. And we also get a boundary term. Uh, which, of course, you could work out and write down. Um, here, I'll just say that it's a boundary term. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we have a volume integral in the first instance, then our boundary term is going to be the boundary of that uh, volume, uh, meaning it's going to be an integral over the area, the surface area of that region. So to go from this step to here, we utilized integration by parts. Now, what about this boundary term? Well, imagine that we had a localized charge distribution rho, not something that went out to infinity, but something that was localized. Then if we extend the volume of our integral to all space, that means the boundary of that all space is something out at infinity. And we know that the electric field and the potential drops off to zero out at infinity when we have a localized charge distribution. So imagine, uh, the energy that's stored in um, a charge distribution, which is localized, we can do an integral over all space. And this volume integral um, will then extend over the entirety of space. And note, of course, that the electric field and the potential are fields which extend over the whole of space. So we can do such an integral. So in that case, we obtain the following uh, eventual result, which is that the work done to assemble a continuum charge distribution is the integral over all space of the electric field dotted into the gradient of the potential, t tau. And the boundary term do drops out, so the integral along the surface of this of this uh, region, as the region grows to infinity, the integral will be equal to zero um, because the electric field, the potential, are dropping off to zero out at infinity. Um, one other uh, thing we can do, of course, here is now recognize that the gradient of the potential is the definition of the electric field up to a minus sign. And so we'll get E dot E which is just e squared, the square modulus of the electric field, t tau. And so this is the result in electrostatics. We can think of the work done to assemble a charge distribution uh, as the integral over all space of the square modulus of the electric field. So this is an interesting result. Uh, there are several uh, things to, to note about this. One is that the principle of superposition does not hold for the energy in a charge distribution because we can see here that we're integrating over the electric field squared. So if I were to think of uh, a charge distribution and then a second charge distribution, the total energy is not just the sum of the energies of the two things because there's some interaction energy between the two things. Um, another way of saying that is that the sum of the squares is not equal to the square of the sum. So we do not have a superposition law for the energy. Another thing to note about this, which is rather interesting on a sort of philosophical level, is that there are different ways of viewing energy in electrostatics. We can think about the energy being stored in the charge distribution itself, the positions of the individual point charges, and we see that from uh, this formula here, where we have an integral over rho times v, and this is over the volume of some particular localized charge distribution. Or we can think about it in this way, where we integrate now over all space, and we're considering the electric field squared over all space. Uh, and we know the electric field is something that's obviously continuous. Even if I have a localized uh, charge distribution in some particular volume, the electric field um, continues to be finite throughout all of space. So there's two kind of different ways of viewing the electric field and the energy stored in a, a charge distribution.
Good. Now let's consider what happens in the case of the magnetic field. Okay, so first we'll consider again the case of the static limit, here magnetostatics. Surely there is some energy stored in a particular current distribution, just as there was energy stored in a particular charge distribution for electrostatics. Can we perhaps view that as energy being stored in the magnetic fields? Immediately, there is something a bit strange about the concept of energy being stored in magnetic fields, because we know that magnetic forces do no work. And that's a, a one-line proof. We simply consider the magnetic part of the work done to be the integral of the force, this is the magnetic force, integrated along some path taken. So we imagine the force is acting on a particle, the particle is tracing out some path, we integrate the force along that path. The force in question is the magnetic force, the magnetic part of the Lorentz force, that is, And we can write that as the charge times the velocity here, V cross the magnetic field, B. V cross B is a vector. And then we dot it in to the DL, the line element, integrated along whatever path the particle is taking. But we write that the uh, line element DL can actually be written as the velocity uh, dt integrated over time. And that's because, going from this step to this step, we just used that the line element is the velocity dt. The velocity, of course, is pointing in the direction of travel. And we multiply that by an infinitesimal time element, and we get the distance uh, traveled. For example, if we were in 1D, dl would just be dx, the, the infinitesimal uh, amount along the x-axis. Uh, the v would be the velocity along the x-direction, which would be dx by dt. And we multiply dx by dt by dt, and we get dx. So it all makes sense. OK, but what we have here, of course, is the velocity crossed into the magnetic field, and that will produce a vector that's mutually perpendicular to both velocity and the magnetic field. And then when we dot it back into the velocity, we must get zero, because the dot product of um, perpendicular vectors is equal to zero. So very straightforwardly, we can show that magnetic forces do no work. So how can there be any kind of energy stored in uh, magnetic fields or in a particular current distribution which is producing the magnetic fields? Well, the answer is that to produce a magnetic field in the first place, we have to change the magnetic field. We have to bring it from zero to its final value. So to produce any magnetic field from nothing, we have to change the magnetic field. And a changing magnetic field induces an electric field against which we must do work in order to produce a given magnetic field configuration. So it's really the process of building up the magnetic field from nothing that induces an electric field. And that electric field is something that we have to do work against. So we can see that there's something very intimate about the connection between um, the magnetic side and the electric side. But we can also see that thinking about the energy stored in a current distribution um, is something that's beyond the, the remit of the static limit. Because to think about the energy stored in that configuration, I actually have to think about changing the magnetic fields and a dynamical situation. How is that magnetic field configuration generated in the first place? And that's a question of dynamics. So that's why I've waited until now to start discussing energy in current distributions or magnetic fields, because now we're equipped
uh, from our discussion in the last lecture on dynamics to uh, make some progress and to settle this question. So, in answering the question as to the energy stored in magnetic fields, first of all, we note that a magnetic field B is generated from a current distribution J. And it takes a certain amount of energy to start a current flowing in a circuit. Why is that? Because we have to do work against the back EMF. So let's consider the EMF of a given uh, circuit denoted by this epsilon. The EMF is the work done in moving a unit charge around the circuit. So let's consider um, a small amount of charge dq. If the EMF is the work done in moving a unit charge around the circuit, then, uh, the, U then the EMF times dq will be a small amount of energy dw required to move that small amount of charge dq around the circuit. And actually, there's a minus sign in this definition because we have to do work on the charge carrier dq in order to get it to flow around the circuit. It's not like as the charge flows around the circuit, it's uh, giving off energy. We have to put work in in order to uh, get the current flowing. Now we can take uh, time derivatives on both sides and look at the rate of change of the work. And given that the EMF is some constant, this is related to the rate of change of the charge. And if we have a closed loop circuit, dq by dt is of course just equal to the current i. So we have an expression here which tells us about the rate of change of the work done in getting a uh, current to flow. And it's uh, proportional to the current that flows. And the proportionality constant is just the EMF. However, we also have this concept of the self-inductance. Which we discussed in the last lecture. The self-inductance L relates the back EMF, epsilon, to the rate of change of current. So we can write epsilon is minus L di by dt. And just to remind you, this formula comes from the proportionality between the magnetic flux through a circuit and the current, the proportionality constant being the self-inductance. And then when we take a time derivative, we find, of course, using the flux rule, that the rate of change of the flux is the EMF. And here on the right-hand side, we have the rate of change of the current. L is a geometric quantity and therefore has no time dependence. So with this formula for the self-inductance, we can now write that the rate of change of the work <clears throat> to get a current flowing around the circuit is equal to uh, L times I times DI by DT. So here I just substituted in epsilon for minus L DI by DT. And here we can play a nice little algebraic game and write I times DI by DT as D by DT of a half I squared. Why is that? Because if I take d by dt of a half i squared, I get one half times two times i times di by dt, and that's exactly what we want. So the work done to get the current flowing, I'll call it uh, w mag, is therefore one half of l i squared. And I get that just by integrating both sides of the above equation uh, with respect to time dt. And I also note that in getting this, that the current is equal to zero and the work done so far is equal to zero um, at time t equals to zero. So we assume that there's no current initially flowing. We build it up from zero to its final value i and we ask how much energy that costs, and the answer is a half Li squared.
OK, but there's actually more we can do <clears throat> because we can actually write this in terms of uh, the magnetic field rather than just the current. And we do that by considering um, the magnetic flux and the magnetic vector potential. So how does that argument go? Well, first of all, we notice that the magnetic flux phi is equal to the self-inductance L times the current I, as before. And so just substituting that in the expression, I can write that the work done is a half I times phi in terms of the flux now. But we know that phi is itself the magnetic field flux through the area enclosed by the circuit loop. And um, therefore, we have a definition of our magnetic flux as so. We can write that in terms of the vector potential, because the magnetic field is just the curl of the vector potential. And then we use one of our favorite mathematics theorems, uh, which is Stokes's theorem, to convert the area integral of a curl to a line integral around the boundary. So this is a line integral around the circuit loop. And we just integrate the vector potential around uh, the line path of the circuit. OK, so this means that we have an alternative expression for our work done. Let me write it here. We can write that the work done is a half i. And then instead of writing the flux, I'm going to write this line integral of a dot dl. And instead of integrating around the, uh, the vector potential around the path, of the circuit that the circuit takes. I can just take this current inside the integral and promote it to a, uh, a vectored quantity uh, dl. So here the current is flowing along the path of the circuit, obviously, and therefore the current vector is something that is in the parallel direction to dl vector. Um, so that's the, the final result. We can write the work done in terms of the magnetic vector potential times the current. And this might remind you a little bit in electrostatics when we had uh, uh, the work done being one half, again, of the integral of the charge distribution times the scalar potential. So here we have the current times the vector potential. And indeed, um, I, w I won't prove this, but uh, some further lines of argumentation can be used to show that this generalizes to a 3D current density uh, J rather than a 1D uh, current around a circuit. So I won't go into the, the proof of this, but in 3D, we have instead of a dot i, we just have a dot j integrated in the volume d tau rather than just around a 1D circuit uh, dl. Again, I'll call this the magnetic parts of the work done. Okay, so apparently there is some uh, work that needs to be done to build up a current distribution. And that's what we have as our final results in three dimensions. Let's write this now in terms of uh, the magnetic field. We can actually do that 
by using Ampere's law that the curl of the magnetic field is proportional to the current density. Now here, I only have to use the result in the static limit because I'm just considering the amount of energy that's stored in some particular static field configuration. Obviously, that field had to be built up from zero, and that's why we're spending the energy. But all I'm interested in here is the end product. So what is the current density now that results in the field now? And I can get that from the theory of magnetostatics, and in particular, Ampere's law. So just substituting that into our expression, um, I can rewrite J in terms of the curl of B. And here I have 1 over mu naught times the curl of B. And all of that is integrated over some volume d tau. Um, as usual, we can now use integration by parts to write this in terms of the integral over some particular volume where our current density is defined of b dot, and then this time it is the curl of a. So again, remember the rule with integration uh, by parts is that we have an integral of the product of two factors. You can transfer the derivative from one factor to the other. And again, of course, we have a boundary term. And it's the same logic applying here as before. Um, that if we have a localized current uh, distribution uh, j, if we integrate over a large region of space, then the boundary term gets smaller and smaller uh, because the magnetic uh, field and the vector potential are dropping off um, as we get further and further away from a localized current distribution. And in fact, if we integrate over all space, then we have uh, the nice result that the boundary term just drops out. And vanishes. And then, of course, we have the nice result that the curl of the vector potential is just the magnetic field, and therefore we have a very similar kind of result to that one in electrostatics, where we can write the work done to assemble a, a given current distribution this time as um, 1 over 2 mu naught times the integral over all space and then of the square modulus of the magnetic field. This is b dot b integrated over all space. So this is a very uh, nice uh, formula, finally, and it's something that looks quite similar to the amount of energy stored in an electrostatic field. So let's just summarize our findings so far. We showed that to assemble a given charge distribution, we can think about that in terms of the integral of a charge distribution times uh, the electric scalar potential, V. Or we can think about it as the integral of the electric field squared integrated over all space. Likewise, on the magnetic side, we think of this, instead of being the charge distribution times the scalar potential, we think of it as the current distribution dotted into the vector potential integrated over some volume detail, which can then 
be written as the integral over all space of the magnetic field squared. So there are two different ways of viewing the energy in electromagnetism. We can either think of the energy stored in um, a current or charge distribution Or we can think of energy stored in the fields themselves. And we'll actually see that usually thinking about the energy being stored in the fields themselves is actually helpful. It's actually a good way to think about the problem. A vivid way to see this is to consider um, electromagnetic waves, so light. So these are waves that can travel through the vacuum. So in the vacuum, we don't have any charge distribution, and we don't have any current distribution. Those things are equal to zero because it's a vacuum. And yet we can still have um, changing electric and magnetic fields that mutually sustain each other to produce the electromagnetic wave. And this electromagnetic wave, which is basically light, of course carries energy. And therefore, it's good to think about the energy as being stored in those fields. And of course, the total energy in the fields is, of course, just the sum of the electric and the magnetic energies, which can be written as one half of the integral of epsilon naught times the square of the electric field plus one over mu naught, the square of the magnetic field, integrated over all space. So this is the total uh, work done to produce electromagnetic fields. And furthermore, we can write down an energy density. And that's because the total energy here is an integral over a volume, over all space, in fact. So the energy density of the EM fields, which I will denote as U for internal energy, subscripts EM for electromagnetism, is exactly one half of epsilon naught E squared plus one over mu naught B squared. And this is the energy density of these electric fields. Just as a peek ahead to something later on in the course, we can also think about the Hamiltonian within this classical uh, electrodynamical system. The Hamiltonian is, of course, related to the total energy. And at this point, I will just state without proof uh, the Hamiltonian is exactly just this energy function, meaning we integrate over space uh, the energy density of these electromagnetic fields. Now, the Hamiltonian is more than just a, f a function that tells you the total energy. It's, uh, it gives you the dynamics of the system through Hamilton's equations of motion. So we can take derivatives of the Hamiltonian with respect to the canonical coordinates of uh, momentum and position, and this will allow us to work out uh, the dynamics of the system, how the uh, canonical coordinates evolve in time. So the Hamiltonian is not just the energy, it tells you about the dynamics of the system. And likewise, we can think about the Lagrangian of our electrodynamical system. And we're going to come back to this in much more detail later on. But for now, for now let me just say that Lagrangian can be th thought of as a Lagrange density integrated over space. 
And uh, for simple mechanical classical systems, the Lagrangian is uh, T minus V, it's the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And I'll just state here without proof, we'll come back to the full derivation of this later, but let me just state now for interest's sake that this Lagrangian density in electromagnetic systems is uh, this object, which is very nearly the um, uh, the uh, energy density of the electromagnetic fields, but with this extra minus sign. And so you can imagine uh, going from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian by converting that minus to a plus. It's sort of rather suggestive that um, this first term here is like a sort of kinetic energy. So the energy that's stored in the electric fields is in some sense akin to a kinetic energy, whereas the uh, energy stored in the magnetic fields is something more like a potential energy. So we'll come back to this in a lot more detail later on and unpack some of the consequences of that, but this is just a little heads up. Okay, so in the next section, I want to talk about the famous work energy theorem. And this has to do with something called the pointing vector. And note, pointing here is spelt with a Y. It's someone's name, I think. And this is basically uh, a story of the local conservation of energy. So previously, in a different lecture, we talked about the conservation of charge. And we saw that um, the total charge in the universe is conserved, and therefore we can write dq by dt is equal to zero. But that this is not enormously helpful in most practical circumstances, because I could imagine some piece of charge sitting here in the room with me, instantaneously disappearing and instantaneously reappearing on Alpha Centauri, let's say, and that would satisfy um, universal charge conservation, <clears throat> but to all intents and purposes, for me sitting in here in this room, a bit of charge just disappears and charge is not conserved. And I have no way of checking that the charge is really appearing elsewhere in the universe. Furthermore, you might worry about causality issues, going faster than the speed of light and information uh, transfer paradox and this kind of thing. Um, so a much more useful and powerful concept is uh, embodied by the so-called continuity equation. And that tells you that the amount of charge in this room can, of course, increase or decrease. But if it's to do that, then some compensating bit of charge has to move through the walls of the room. So this is like a, a continuous process. A bit of charge has to continuously move from the room to outside the room if the amount of charge in the room is to change. So it's a continuity equation embodying the concept of local charge conservation. Now here in electrodynamics, when we're talking about energy, we have something very similar. The total energy in the universe is of course conserved, but more strong than that, we have another statement which says that the energy in a particular volume can increase or decrease so long as there's an energy flux through the walls of the container. It's a continuity equation for energy, and we call it the work energy theorem. So let's see how this works. Let's start from the beginning. It's a good place to start. We'll consider the work done as the integral of the force integrated along some particular path moved by some object. That's parameterized by this uh, line element dl vector. And what we're going to consider is um, the work done due to electromagnetic forces. And so I'm going to convert this I'm going to be a bit more specific. I'm going to write this F as the electromagnetic force, which is, of course, the Lorentz force. And then I'm going to play that same game as before and write dl, the line element vector, dl vector, as v vector dt 
And please note here that this V is the velocity. It's not the electric scalar potential, it's the velocity. It's a vector, you see there's a vector on the top there, that's a giveaway. Okay, um, so let's now write this in terms of the uh, Lorentz force. And we're going to get an electric field component. And then as I showed you a few moments ago, um, the magnetic part of the force does no work. And therefore, our W, our work done, can be written as Q times uh, the electric field dot the velocity uh, dt integrated over time. So let's um, rearrange this slightly and consider the rate of change of work, dw by dt. That is obviously q times e dot v. So the rate of change of the work is the charge times electric field times the velocity. Let's now go to the continuum. Let's not think about a single point charge, uh, but a, a, a continuum of charge distribution. So the Q is going to be replaced as usual by rho uh, d tau. I could have already done this at the stage of uh, putting in the, uh, the, the Lorentz force there, but I'll just do it at this stage. So I'm replacing Q by rho d tau. And then I integrate, and what I find, therefore, is that dw by dt, the rate of change of the work done, is just the integral d tau of rho, the charge density, times e dot the velocity v. Uh, but by definition, the charge density times the velocity field of all of the individual particles is exactly the definition of the current. So we have an alternative expression for the energy in an electromagnetic system. In, to be specific, what I mean is the rate of change of the energy in a, in a particular system due to electromagnetic forces is the electric field dotted into the current distribution and integrated over a particular volume. So this might seem a little bit of a, a strange uh, result. Just to remind you, I went from here to here by using the definition that the current density is equal to the charge density times the velocity field. Okay, so what we now have ahead as our task is to try to unpack the uh, mathematical and physical meaning of this integral of e dot j. So before doing the integral, let's just consider uh, the quantity e dot j, the integrands there, and see what we can make of it. Okay, so to make some progress here, I want to actually use the Maxwell Ampere law. And that tells us something about the curl of the magnetic field. And we could write that in terms of the current distribution J and the time derivative of the electric field E. And with this, we can rearrange this equation for J and then substitute it into our integrand expression for E dot J. So we can write that E dot J, uh, by rearranging Maxwell-Ampere law for J and then substituting it in, gives us the following. <laughs> 
Okay, good. And now we can manipulate this a little bit further. In particular, in this first term, we have e dot the curl of b. And we can use product rule here within vector calculus to rewrite uh, the curl in here in the following way. We can write it as 1 over mu naught. That's an overall factor. And then we can use the rules of vector calculus to rewrite this as b dot the curl of e minus the divergence of e cross b. So you don't have to remember these formulae, but it's a good idea to know that they exist and where to look them up. And then, we're not done yet, we can use Faraday's law to expand this piece. Because here we have the curl of E, and by Faraday's law, I can write the curl of E in terms of um, minus dB by dt. Good. And so, putting it all together, we have this piece, we have this piece, and then we have this piece. I can write that E dot J can be written as, uh, let me just collect up these various terms. We have minus 1 over mu naught b dot db by dt. We have minus 1 over mu naught the divergence of e cross b. And then finally we have minus epsilon naught e dot dE by dt. And actually here we can do uh, a nice mathematical trick, we've actually seen it before, which is that if we consider this term here, for example, we can write b dot db by dt as d by dt of a half b squared. And we can actually do that also with the electric field here. And so overall, um, we have the nice result that E dot J can be written as minus one half D by DT of one over mu naught B squared plus epsilon naught E squared magnetic and electric fields. And then there's this minus this funny piece, which involves the divergence of E cross B. The cross product of the electric and magnetic fields. So using our previous definition of the energy density in electromagnetic fields, uh, we can now actually write that this object E uh, dot J that we need to understand the change in, in the energy stored in the electromagnetic fields can actually be written simply as minus one half of D by DT of this uh, energy density minus the divergence of E cross B, which I'll now call S for the pointing vector. So the U uh, E M is the in, is like the internal energy, if you like. It's the energy density stored in 
the electric and magnetic fields. Whereas this S is just E cross B. Um, with an overall factor of one over mu naught. And this thing goes by the name of the pointing vector. And we'll unpack the meaning of this pointing vector in the following. So let's now put all of this together and consider again the final form of the work energy theorem in electromagnetism. We have that the rate of change of the work done to assemble a given uh, electromagnetic field configuration is the integral over some volume of space, not all space, just some volume of space that we're interested in, of e dot j d tau. And then this can be written as minus d by dt of the integral of the energy density of the uh, electromagnetic fields uh, minus the divergence of the pointing vector, d tau. And by using uh, the divergence theorem, we can convert this volume integral of the divergence into a surface integral bounding that particular volume of the pointing vector dA, with dA being the vector area. Okay, so we're finally uh, at the end. We can write that the rate of change of the energy, or the work done to assemble a given electromagnetic field configuration, is minus d by dt of the integral in some volume of the energy density of the fields minus a surface integral. The surface here is the surface of the, the, uh, the volume being integrated in the first term. And so we see that this second integral here is actually kind of a flux of this S object through the surface of this volume. And we can now readily understand what the pointing vector is because we have on the left-hand side the rate of change of the work done in on the right-hand side in the first term we have the change in the energy stored in the fields in a given volume. So therefore, the last term must precisely be the energy flux leaving through the walls of the container. So S itself, the pointing vector, is an energy flux density and it tells us the direction that the energy is flowing. So this is a vectored object 
S tells us the direction that the energy is flowing, and the magnitude of S is the amount of energy that's leaving per unit area through the walls of the container. So the work energy theorem is a kind of continuity equation for energy. It says that a change in the internal energy is equal to the energy lost through the walls. And of course, if we consider all space, then dW by dt is equal to zero. One nice example of the uh, work energy theorem in action is to see how energy is flowing out away from an oscillating electric dipole. When we have uh, an oscillating electric dipole, as we'll see in the next few lectures, we'll have dipole radiation. This radiation is in the form of electromagnetic waves, and these waves are carrying energy out of the system. So let's see a quick animation of this. So what's plotted here is a vector field corresponding to the pointing vector, and the electric dipole is oscillating in the vertical uh, direction. And we can see that energy is being radiated away from this electric dipole. OK, so in this lecture, we looked at the energy stored in electromagnetic fields. In the first part, we looked again at the energy stored in uh, electrostatic systems, which are due to a static um, charge distribution, which could either be discrete or described by a continuum charge density rho. Then we looked at the energy stored in uh, a static uh, magnetic system, so a steady system with steady currents and steady magnetic fields also contains a certain amount of energy. And the reason why it contains energy is to build up that magnetic field uh, configuration, we have to actually change the magnetic field, and that induces an electric field against which we have to do work. Finally, we considered the work energy theorem, which is a kind of continuity equation for energy. It tells us about how the, if the energy in a given region changes, that's related to an energy flux, which is the energy leaving the volume through the walls of the container. Uh, that's described by the so-called pointing vector S, which is just E cross B, and it tells you the direction that the energy is flowing and the magnitude of the energy lost.